Wait until we're on air. Make it more official. Oh, we're on air. All right, so welcome to the next budget meeting. I believe it's the third. Um, we are Tuesday, March 3rd. And I'm going to pass it over to Elizabeth Seifries, the finance chair. Thank you. So good evening and welcome to the third of five planned budget workshops. The budget review schedule is available here tonight in hard copy as well as on the school department website. All budget workshops are open to the public, recorded and posted online with public comment welcomed. The school board will open and close each meeting with the, an opportunity for public comment and questions and comments may be sent to me as well via email. Please go to the town or school department website, navigate to the school board section and click on the email link to send your thoughts to us. The school board's goals for the 2020-2021 budget are <clears throat> number one, maintain and improve the high quality of education for every student. Number two, careful examination of line items and consideration of the success and effectiveness of expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget. Number three, support the 2020 through 2025 strategic plan goals. Number four, clear and continual communication throughout the budget process. With regard to goal one, the continued excellence of our schools is a great advantage to our community and point of pride in Cape Elizabeth. This commitment to outstanding education is evident in our Blue Ribbon Awards and state and national rankings. Thus, the singular purpose of each item in our budget is the continued or improved quality of education for our students. Next, each line item must be scrutinized to understand how and why it is contributing to student success in concert with its impact to the budget. Budget goal three highlights our broad community and school department priorities for the next five years. Our current strategic plan goals were adopted in the fall of 2019 following a community forum of over 100 people called the Future Search, which included community members, parents, faculty, staff, students, administrators, and board members. The thoughts, aspirations, and concerns from that large gathering were distilled into these goals. Health and well-being. Our schools will provide a supportive learning environment in which physical, social, and emotional well-being are valued and promoted. Global competency. Our students will be personally responsible, aware, empathetic, and engaged local and global citizens. Multiple pathways and definitions of success. Our schools will value, promote, and celebrate multiple pathways and definitions of success. Safe, sustainable, and effective facilities. Our schools will be safe and effective facilities. They will be updated and maintained to meet the needs of students and staff in accordance with long-term financial planning. Environmental responsibility. The school department will prioritize environmental responsibility, including stewardship and sustainability. <clears throat> Finally, in order for all stakeholders to understand and be a part of this school budget process, therefore giving it the robust review and input it deserves, the superintendent and school board must communicate clearly and often throughout the process. We will hold these goals and goals and in inside goals in mind as we examine each cost center, each department, each school, and each program. As we move through every step of this process, we must also keep in mind the ongoing building committee conversation about the necessary improvements to and possible replacement of our buildings. At the end of January, each of our administrators and directors gave an overview of his or her department or school, which included cost center information, staff and program reviews, and new staff or program proposals. Last week, business manager Marcy Weeks gave us an ED-279 state subsidy update, and then we began hearing answers to previously submitted questions. Tonight, we would like to try to finish hearing those answers to previously submitted questions, and then we would like to take a deep look at enrollment and staffing. 
At this time, the floor is open to any members of the public that wish to speak. Please step up to the podium in order that everyone may better hear you and please give us your name and address. Seeing none, let's go ahead and move on with our answers to previously asked questions. I believe, did we leave off? Oh, did Ellen? I make one oh. comment before we start that? I just want to let the public know that um, unfortunately there was a miscommunication last week <coughs> and um, <coughs> hearing uh, Elizabeth's goal about clear communication, it was an, it was, an unfortunate error. Uh, we had intended to videotape it. Fortunately, it was a good meeting to not have videotaped because we went through the question and answers and the print, it was with the principals last week and they all had a document um, that should be uploaded onto our website under the budget. So, which um, I believe were there, I think I are, went and saw them. Right, so um, if you were interested and you were looking for the video, it doesn't exist, but the information is online and uh, there was a little bit of discussion, but not much, most of the information is right there. So you didn't miss much. I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did we leave off with Noel or Dell? Dell. So Director of Special Services. And did Noel complete his? I know he did a quick. He gave us sheet. sheet. Was that complete? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good evening. Hi. Um, so the one question that I had, and I apologize, so I don't have it in front of me, but it had to do with whether or not we have heard any more information or new information out of Maine DOE with regard to the public schools assuming responsibility for the CDS students, uh, the three to, specifically the three to five. So CDS is Child Development Services, and it is the uh, special education piece of uh, basically birth to five, and it is divvied up into birth to two and three to five. And the state has been talking about um, having the three to five group become the responsibility of public schools. Uh, there has been a lot of back and forth. Um, I can say that as of uh, last year that finally the CDS folks actually got raises and it looked like perhaps there was an effort to preserve CDS at that time. The problem, uh, there, at one point there was a proposal to phase it in and that the public schools would take on the four-year-olds and then the following year would take on the, th the three-year-olds. And uh, the problem is that it would decimate CDS and they were struggling to, to meet the needs as it was. And so they really didn't want, didn't believe that that would be an, an effective plan at that time. So at this point, there is no new, 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 no new news, excuse me. The other piece that we really kind of need to talk about is the other part that's being batted around is universal preschool. And so, um, as most of you know, I worked in other districts that were outside of Cumberland County prior to coming to Cape. And most, if not all of those districts had started their own public preschools. But I believe the reason being is that um, those schools have had decreases in their enrollments and thus had the physical space to do so. And so a lot of the outlying areas outside of Cumberland County, I will say that uh, <coughs> I meet with the Cumberland County directors and they did talk about who has preschool at this time and essentially no one raised their hand. So Cumberland County as a whole has not seen huge decreases in enrollment that would allow them to have the physical space to start these preschool programs. But some of them are trying or making an attempt to do that. And of course, if you have a preschool program where you're already bringing in the four-year-olds, it would be much easier to service and pick up the needs with regard to the CDS piece. Um, so there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of debate still going on at the state. And as far as I know, they haven't really landed on uh, a definitive answer on that. Also, uh, Elizabeth, you had asked me about, or Elizabeth and Donna had asked me about just kind of doing a quick rundown of current staff 
that support special education programs across the district in relation to the physical space they require to do their job. Would you like me to do that at this time? I think we're actually going to talk about enrollment and um, how that sort of drives our staffing and, and the mandates that drive staffing after everybody gets through their questions, if you don't mind. Sure. And are there any other questions that I'm not aware of? I just wanted to clarify, is CDS Child Development Services? Yes. Okay. And again, that's the, the special ed component for students who are birth of, birth of five or birth of five. Thank you. So I don't see Noel. He did provide us with a sheet. Right. So the question was that he had a proposal named Double Robotics, which was for a telepresence robot. And um, I, I had asked the question, you know, double robotics sounded confusing and, you know, what did it refer to and that sort of thing. And he basically just renamed his proposal. <laughs> so, um, and he gave that to us last time. I'm going to skip ahead to... Yep, he renamed the proposal to Telepresence Robot. Everything else is the same in that new proposal. And you can add that to your technology tab. We did have another question for Noel with regard to the cost of maintaining iPads at the, the lower elementary school. So um, with that outstanding, um, maybe you can share that with us next time. And we already had a brief discussion about the um, smart boards versus whiteboards and that sort of thing, so we can move through that. And um, I believe Perry is next. is next, if you're ready to roll. and thank you. Um, I believe I have one question broken into two parts here. The need for more custodial staff is well documented over the years. You have noted four various position requests and have ranked them in priority. It looks like some of them are partially or completely designated for the town work as opposed to school work. Part one is, have you included these partial or full town positions in your proposed budget to the town manager? The answer to that is yes. Um, I will be meeting with town council on the March 16th and going over the town budget with them as well. Um, and then part two to this question is, are budget impacts for these positions clearly delineated between town side and school side? And that answer is also yes. Um, I believe it's uh, in the design of the one town concept, there was a percentage that was agreed upon on both sides and we, we hold to that percentage that the town pays a portion in the school, the other part. And that's it. The other questions I had, I believe were answered by Jason and Noel as they were a little more academic specific than mm -hmm us doing the physical work, but <laughs> do you have any other questions? Any other questions at this time? I'm here all night. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Perry. Thank you. Next up, Kathy Stankard. So I have three questions, which I've broken into four. Um, one is about the EL program, our English learner program, and the other three are about our gifted and talented program. So the first question is, do you feel you have an adequate understanding of current and incoming English learner needs? I'll be referring to them as ELs. 
so that the Cape Elizabeth School Department can provide appropriate support for those students, which is a great question, because of course we want to. Um, so the first question is really, how do we know who our English learners are? And those of you who have registered children in our school district might recall that you completed a language use survey. This is required of all. Uh, parents and guardians, guardians of incoming students. If there are indications of a primary use of language other than English, then our certified EL teacher, one of our two certified EL teachers, administers a screener. Um, we're looking for a composite score, that would be reading, writing, speaking, and listening of 4.5 out of six. Um, if they have a score lower than that, then the EL teacher will prepare an individualized learn, individualized language acquisition plan, or ILAP, um, and that specifies the services that that student will receive. Um, all students who are identified as English learners must take this annual WIDA Access for L's um, exam. It's administered typically in January, although the scores aren't released until the end of April, beginning of May, which is an issue with budgeting, but we'll get to that. Once they earn a 4.5, again out of 6, composite score, then they're exited from EL services and placed on monitor status for two years. So that's how we know who our English learners are. Obviously, um, it's easier to evaluate our current English learner needs than our incoming English learner needs. We can anticipate how students are going to perform on the annual assessment, but until they're actually enrolled in our system, um, we don't know um, what, our, what their needs are going to be and what our needs are going to be. Currently, we have two half-time teachers who are providing services to 13 English learners at Pond Cove four English learners at the middle school, and six English learners at the high school. Recently, uh, last month, we received guidance from the Federal Department of Education Office for Civil Rights that suggests we may need to increase our English learner instruction for students whose English learner proficiency is at a level 1.0 or 2.0, again, out of six. They're supposed to be receiving at least two periods of English language um, instruction per day. Our English language teachers concur with this recommendation and that is not currently happening. Um, but we'll see where we're at when we get the this year's WIDA access for EL scores. Um, so yes, until we receive those um, and then even after given new student registrations, we always have to build some flexibility into our budgeting and we have to be prepared to increase staffing accordingly, which is how we went from uh, uh, half-time EL teacher to a point eight EL teacher to now we have two half-time EL teachers. Any questions about that before I move on? Yes. Um, so what we currently have budgeted for, does that a lot for this increased? Um, no, because the budget was prepared before we got this guidance. Okay. So we will have to look again after we get the scores at the end of April and we know what our obligations are, but again, we could get a couple of families moving in in August and then we're coming back to you and saying we, it's, it's a little bit like special education, you know, it, this is a, a federal mandate, it's the right thing and we need to meet that need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you um, mentioned the numbers of students that are currently receiving EL services. Last year, did, uh, how many scored a one or that they would need additional? Um, what percentage of um, I think last year we had <clears throat> three students exit the program. So now they're on monitor status. By exiting, I mean they hit that 4.5. Is that what you were asking? Well, I was asking the ones that only hit the one or would you say one or two that they would need then two periods of... Right, okay. Um, I don't have that number off the top of my head. Okay. I can get that for you though, where we're at right now. Bearing in mind confidentiality, obviously. Right. Yeah. And last question. Sure. Do, would we have testing information from our current students um, at the end of this year or would it be done at oh, the end yeah. of Oh yeah, no, no, we'll, we'll get those at the end of April, beginning of May okay. for all of our current students. Yeah. Right. Um, yes. We, 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 we had some students enroll in January, but I think they enrolled soon enough to be <coughs> tested. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, 
So my next question, the next three are about the, the gifted and talented program. So how do you, the building principals, and the GT teacher work together to give the GT students the curriculum they need in a manner that does not rob them of other beneficial experiences? And that, my friends, is always a challenge with any pullout program, whether English learner, special education, or gifted and talented all of which are federal and state mandates or state mandates. So we do our best to prioritize. Last year, for example, we felt that the fourth graders identified for GT services were not getting enough time with the GT teacher. Um, so now this year, instead of being scheduled with that teacher once a week on Friday, um, they see that teacher three times per week at the same time. Um, and then the grade four teacher is just um, plan around the pullout, which again they do whenever their students are being pulled out to ensure that no new content is being introduced. Our seventh and eighth graders identified for GT services meet with the GT teacher, their CGAT teacher, two out of every six win blocks. So that still leaves them four win blocks to access their content teachers for additional enrichment or support. Um, the difficulty in our grades, with our grades five and six, um, is that the students are scheduled into blocks, um, but they don't have study hall as an option, and the GT teacher is already using the win block to meet with the seventh and eighth graders. So a decision was made to schedule the CGAT, Cape Elizabeth Gifted and Talented Program, during the library general music block, which meets every other day. The feeling was that the GT teacher could collaborate with the library media specialist to make sure that the skills the students were getting, the other students were getting during the library block could be gotten through the GT program. Um, and almost all, if not all, of our CGAT students um, are enrolled in band or chorus so they can get their general music through, through that. Um, so we're doing, we're doing what we can. But that brings me to the next question, which is how do you make sure that the GT curriculum offered to students is what they actually need? So for the past two years, when a student was identified for GT services, the GT teacher would prepare an individualized learning plan for each student to inform that student's instruction in CGAT, but it was just prepared by the teacher. So we've gotten recent, recently, we've gotten more guidance from the state, um, and based on that, we're gonna be adopting a team approach to ILP development, the same type of team approach that's used with special education or, or uh, English, learn, English learners. So over the course of the next few months, the GT teacher is gonna be involving the classroom teachers, parents, and the student in creating a plan and set a service that reflects each student's needs um, in order to inform scheduling and programming for next year. Any questions about that before I go on to the last? Well, I'll just finish GT and then you can ask me questions. Okay, so the last question is how do you evaluate the success of the gifted and talented program? Um, at the end of the year, the GT teacher, the principals and I discuss what worked and what needs improvement and then those changes um, that we want to make are reflected on next year's application for state funding. Um, we are aware that missing from that process is a formal survey of students and parents, and we intend to administer that for the first time this year. And I just wanted to remind you and the people watching at home that um, in the five years that we've provided GT services, we've had four GT teachers, and that the first two of those were part-time only. So we are still growing the program, and there is clearly room for improvement. Any questions? I hope that ended on a positive note. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up we have Pardon? Peter. Yeah. School nutrition. Peter? Yep. I was looking for you because you had been sitting over there and you had already moved and then where did he go? Do I not say Peter? Did he leave? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have one question. Since we've moved away from the federal restrictions and the funds that go with them as the high school, how are we doing feeding high school students who are unable to pay for lunch? Are we tracking those, um, those who access free or reduced lunch and are we meeting student needs? The answer to that is yes, um, but I'll, I'll elaborate. Um, 
one of, one of the things this year um, that we've done, as we've done in previous years, we have an online application process, plus we also have the paper applications and it can be done, um, we can send them home or whatnot. So that's something that we've continued to do. This year alone, we have three extra free students and one less reduced student. Um, reduced students this year are free. Um, We've absorbed the cost of that, so the numbers right now, what we've, what we've lost in subsidy is $4,221. What we've increased in revenue is $39,734.55. So I would say that it's working quite well. Um, so we are meeting their needs. We have no, um, I, I think that we easily can absorb that, so I'm, I'm very happy that it's working out. Any other questions? Great. That is great. Thank you. I think we were all like, oh, go ahead, Kimberly. I was gonna, um, do you have any way to track if the students who would have qualified for the free and reduced lunch are taking advantage Absolutely. of it now? Absolutely. We're about 50% of what our, what our free is, and that's exactly what it was the year prior and prior to that. So we have 30 identified, but only 15 eat at a time or so. Yeah. Um, some may eat breakfast, some may not, some may eat lunch, but you know, we're, we're getting about the same participation. So that has we we had hoped maybe for a little. We, we've yeah. increased our meal counts. The the people the kids are eating more. I mean, you can see by the by the increase in revenue that they're eating more. Right. We're, we're averaging over, well over a hundred more meals a, a month now um, yeah. than we were prior. So that's I was thinking, helped increase that. Oh, sorry. As well. I was thinking more that maybe we were hoping to capture more of the students for the free and reduced lunch we, program to take advantage. Yeah, like I said, of, we we've done three more this year. And three so. more. So okay, that's what I was getting. At. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was just, uh, if I was remembering correctly from last year, because they had to take a milk or they had to and take had certain to take things, so they were, right, so they were more singled out, and now that that's not occurring, we have three additional. We have three but, additional. Okay. Not, not a ton, but, you know, that's pretty much, the, there's not a huge amount in the district period. So. Right. Okay. Thank you. So. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have athletics and Jeff Thorick, please. participation over the last 10 years has remained steady. What has changed that presents the need for an assistant at this time? Are the things you described um, doing always been your responsibility? And some of the items seem like they may fall under um, public works and facilities. So to answer that first question, um, as you know, Cape Elizabeth um, is falls under a one-town concept. Um, this philosophy is, I think, unique from a lot of the communities in the area, uh, especially unique to our comparables. Um, most school districts have a designated facility and grounds department. Um, in addition to the traditional uh, school and grounds work, the responsibilities would also include athletic equipment and field maintenance. So currently, our facilities uh, department uh, are responsible for all of the town and school buildings. So just to name a few, that's the three schools, the fire station, police station, Thomas Memorial, Town Hall, Public Works, Fort Williams buildings. Um, and then our Public Works Department, the Parks Department, or the Parks um, subgroup from the Public Works is responsible for all of the school grounds, the fields, Fort Williams, Spurling Cemetery, Gullcrest, Lionsfield, Playstead, the neighborhood walkways, town entrance gardens, um, all the island gardens in the center of town. Um, so I think it's safe to say that as the town facilities and our recreational space has steadily expanded over the years, uh, which are all positive uh, improvements in benefiting our community and our residents in, in so many positive ways. Um, I've had the 
opportunity to work very closely with our parks department and our facilities and maintenance crews. They do a wonderful job. Uh, they take great pride in their work. Um, they do as much as possible to support the schools, the athletic department. Um, however, um, with this increase in the expansion of facilities and, and space, there's been a pretty significant increase in their workload. Um, and personnel-wise, that rate has remained fairly static over the years. Therefore, leaving crews stretched thin, uh, if not beyond maximum capacity at times. So I think we're at a point um, where some of the day-to-day -day work, we end up drawing from time and resources from other areas. And that's just traditional day-to-day -day stuff. Um, you know, when you factor in some of the longer and short-term projects, um, that becomes even more of a challenge. So how has this impacted athletics? Um, I'd say just in the past couple of years, we've seen a, a significant increase in the preseason equipment and field maintenance, preseason and postseason. Um, so that's things like just repairing and maintenance, painting goals, um, installing nets, filling sandbags uh, for that help counter the weight on goals. And, you know, getting trash and recycle containers out on the fields, um, installing the windscreens on the tennis courts, just to name a, just to name, those, that's just a small portion. Uh, another piece that has significantly improved or in, increased as far as the time required um, for me personally in the athletic department would be Hannaford Field Stadium and the upkeep of Hannaford Field. Um, I've assumed really the grooming responsibilities, repairing fencing, um, blowing off bleachers and walkways, dealing with porta potties. Um, that part of the um, extra time required has, has definitely increased and um, spent a lot of time down there. So, There's also been an increase in just the daily maintenance and not having um, like a designated facilities and grounds crew that would work at the schools. You know, our, our equipment gets moved daily. And when you're moving equipment, things loosen up, bolts loosen up, um, so they need to be constantly checked. You know, there's safety concerns, so things just need to be checked on a regular basis. Um, that just has to be done. And um, often we may see something and it may be 3 p.m. And at 3 p.m., um, essentially everyone's gone home at that point. So ultimately someone's got to do that. Uh, so that's where, that's where it impacts athletics and myself. Also seen an increase in Saturday athletic contests. Um, and the result of this has been a busing shortage. So easier to transport on a weekend or on a Saturday and increase in makeup games. So at one point, Saturdays were a day that I could attend to a lot of those additional duties. Now that has moved on to, to Sunday. That's the only day left to, to get some of this stuff done. Um, so kind of circling back, what has changed, um, I just, you know, the, the amount of work, the workload uh, has increased and the personnel to, to really maintain and, and work on these projects has remained fairly, fairly steady, fairly static. Uh, can, can public works or facilities and maintenance pick up some of these things? Uh, I, don't, I don't, you know, I think, it would require some significant changes in restructuring in their, in their departments, I think, to make that work effectively. And um, so I, it would be difficult for me to answer on behalf of their, on behalf of uh, Perry and, and uh, Bob, Bob Malley. So that's a little bit about, well, I, I guess I could take any questions on that part. 
Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for all you do. It's a big job, and I think, uh, at least I'll speak from my perspective, uh, the understanding of what you do and the enormity of the task is becoming a little bit clearer. So by no means do I offer this as an end-all, be-all suggestion. Um, but I'm wondering, I know I have two boys in high school and they play baseball and I know when you mentioned the tennis uh, windscreen, I know at the beginning of the season they have to go in one day and help put up, is it a windscreen for the baseball field as well, is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, and so they have to do that. Um, I know that there's parents that go and help clean up the fields before the uh, lacrosse season, is it at Goldcrest maybe? Um, so I guess my, my question being is can boosters and teams help out so much? And here's, here's my thinking is that we just had in the high school, uh, I believe successful day on February 14th with community service, um, going outside the district to various places and do the, do the work. Is there a way that we can cultivate more stewardship, more um, community service right here and have uh, the students who are participating in these sports take a little bit more ownership and upkeep? I mean, I, 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 again, I'm not trying to be the answer and, and, and take away your request for support. Um, it seems very clear to me that you need that. I'm, I'm asking this as an addition. I also recognize that there are certain situations that is not appropriate for the students, right? But it also seems like dealing with trash, like kids can help do that. It seems like sweeping down bleachers, kids can help do that. Um, has that been looked at? Is that explored? Do they not have the time? Um, I just think that that's an untapped, uh, and maybe I'm not aware of it, but but there's a huge resource that, that can be utilized here. We've got lots of kids wanting to do community service and help back, and how amazing to do it right here in your own, in your own place where you live. Um, and I recognize that that also takes some uh, organization and some overseeing in a different way. So I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, no, I think it's a, that's a great point. I, I agree fully. I think when, when the students are invested, I've just found um, even with Hannah from Field, little reminders to kids about cleaning up their bench areas. And, and then eventually it gets to the point where that's, the norm, and, yeah. um, and and the kids do a good job of that, I think, for the most part. Um, and we do, you know, for tennis, uh, I think it's great. We have the coaches out there and a number of players that do come out and help with the windscreens. Um, yeah. But you're right. I think we did a volunteer program a couple of years ago where we had people out and um, during achievement period for a couple of hours, I think it was, and just picking up trash around campus and yeah. painting and doing some some projects. To, it required some some organization, but uh, definitely, I think reap a lot of benefits for sure. So, yeah, yeah, no, I agree. That's a. I think, Important concept. I, yeah, I think, um, you know, we're talking about sports, you know, music, similar, but sports and theater, they all, they have something to teach, right? Sports has the community, it has the, the, the sportsmanship, it has the team quality and all that. And I, I think there's just another element that can be, that can be taught to these kids. And, and I recognize that there's organization that happens in the background, but... I believe that this district can rock that, yep. for lack of better words. And I try, you know, I think one thing too with, with parents is they do a lot. You know, our boosters yeah. do a lot. Parents do a lot, and it's. Hard. I was already going to chime in and say, guess who puts up the batting cage for the softball yes. team and takes it down? And My husband. I yeah. Struggle sometimes. <laughs> and other parents. Yeah. Asking. And it's one not one more thing. Right. From, yeah. So that's a hard yes. It's that balance. It's and a balance. Sometimes we just don't have a choice. I mean, we need yeah. the help. And <clears throat> yeah. Um, you know, softball parents and baseball, I think in the spring they have a day, like you mentioned, and everyone just shows up and mm -hmm. all hands on deck. And yeah. I'm by no means, though, please don't misunderstand me saying how enormous your job is and how I think it sounds like you need support beyond just the help of students. So yeah, and it's, I want it's you to say just the that. time. There's just uh, Absolutely. the work uh, I'm okay with. It, it, it's the time. There's just really honest. There's physically not enough time now to get some of these things done and do my job at the expectations that I have for myself and I think the expectations this community has for 
sure. the program in, in the schools. So. Mm -hmm. Kimberly? This um, might, I don't know, it might be more of an Elizabeth Donna question. Um, the, I, I always struggle with the one town concept of, you know, really where, you know, are the fields totally the school responsibility? Is it town? Um, is, has there been any thought or conversation about perhaps having this uh, jointly funded position uh, between the town and I, the school? I think the issue is that, um, as Jeff was saying, um, the, the maintenance people are so stretched thin that it pro that person would probably get pulled to, to go do something else. And I think um, that's been the problem in the past and um, they're just stretched really thin. And yeah, if one person calls out sick, then it, I mean, Perry experiences this with the custodians. Yeah. It really has an impact on everyone else and how they do their jobs. And so you're really it's talking about somebody that would could be just dedicated to some of these school specific exactly. tasks. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's. I would say at this point, probably sixty to seventy hours um, a week. So there's definitely time. That <laughs> there's plenty of work. Someone could. Assist if, if possible. Um, understand that you know that may not be the case, but at least I think we're having a good conversation. And maybe, and again, I'm not making any judgments towards our one-time concept. I think that's a that's a bigger discussion, but that's just how it impacts mm -hmm. athletics. And often we fall kind of in the middle mm -hmm. of is this is this a fields? Are goals part of the field, or is that school? And it can get a little confusing. And, but Everyone does the best that they can to try to make it work, and, mm -hmm. and that's the important piece. No one's saying that that's just not our area. It's um, so I just want to be clear with that. I think that your next question might you might need some assistance from Donna because it's sort of like where would this person fall in a contract? I think situation? Jeff's, Jeff and Marcy have talked oh, about you this. Oh, you Marcy Great. and I have talked awesome. about this. So. <laughs> so, I, I don't necessarily, um, the, the question was regarding um, would this person um, be part of Perry's crew um, or would the, and then another question was the proposed pay scale. So this pay scale piece, I'm not sure if I have the, the correct info, um, however, I think, I think it would make sense for the position to fall under Perry with the soup, with the supervisor being myself, um, but for collective bargaining, bargaining purposes, I think that would probably make sense to have them be part of the maintenance. Mm -hmm. So I think their official title is uh, bus drivers, custodians, and maintenance mechanic, collective bargaining unit. Mm -hmm. But right. the pay scale piece? Well, that, <laughs> no, that makes sense, just knowing where okay. they would fall, no, then they, they would be in that. They would be in that, yeah. Because if it was an administrative assistant, then that's a different group. And it's also kind of different job description. The administrative assistants aren't usually out with a leaf blower <laughs> or mowing. Um, and then the third question, uh, how will the success of the proposed middle school track, indoor track coach be evaluated? And, um, so the addition of the third middle school indoor track coach will provide the necessary supervision and safety and instruction for practices in, in track meets. The success of the proposed position will be evaluated by the athletic director um, along with a feedback from the middle school athletic liaison and the middle school indoor track coaches. So that was that. Guessing we have a, a lot of kids doing middle school track. Oh. There is a large number, which is great. It's fantastic. I mean, it's, it's that March is an awesome time because it's in between seasons. So with swimming and indoor track, I think those are great opportunities, is especially it, for middle school. It's always been relatively large. Is it growing? Is it expanding still? It's it's into that 50 to 60 yeah. students. So it's a pretty high number, especially yeah. for middle school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So third person, having that third person is, Super helpful, and it's a, it's a it's a 
it, the sport requires, the practice is required to be in so many different areas. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there may be a group down at the high school using the high jump pits in, in the gym. Uh, there could be another group doing some stuff in the middle school gym, and then maybe another group doing some road work or yeah. campus training, running on campus. Mm -hmm. Great. Any questions? Thank you. Super, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Yes, Office of the Superintendent. Okay, so I had two questions. Um, what is the actual cost of the proposed district-wide nursing support aid? Um, what is the cost of 8.5 LPN? So um, you have actually a new um, proposal sheet with the proposed salary and benefit uh, costs. We did some research and called around some other districts about what the pay is for an LPN. Um, you'll remember that the last time this position was in the budget, it was not an LPN, mm -hmm. and the nurses really felt that because there was so much data entry required that needed to be pretty technical, we needed somebody that um, had an understanding of the nursing field, and also to do some, um, this person um, might do some basic intake of students, and they needed an understanding of, again, nursing procedures, so um, they suggested that it be an LPN. So the salary would be $29,815, and this would be a, um, again, a 0.5 position, and then um, benefits would be half-time, part-time benefits, so $12,037, so it would be about um, almost $42,000 for this position. Could, could I just ask the handout that we had on our desks tonight? It's um, it lists it as twenty six thousand nine hundred forty four, and maybe this is an older copy, although it is it's dated today. But it, but what you have here is yes. accurate yeah. as far as cost goes. Oh yeah, Mar uh, Marcy sheet yeah. So we'll need to. I think, yeah. On the sheet that we had tonight, um, I found out that we'll be having a prorated amount for benefits. So I had to adjust the benefits down. I had the benefits too high in the first proposal. But the salary is different. The well. salary. Oh, and the salary is at um, half time, half of the full time amount. Of so 29. I have 29,000, you have 26,000. So Do I have 26,000 in there? Yeah. So. Okay, well, I'll revisit that. We will figure out what that is. It's around that. <laughs> Thank you. It's in the neighborhood. Um, the next question is, there was a recommendation by a former board chair to add iPads for the school board members as the town council members have to support our strategic goals around environmental responsibility. So we don't have all this paper. Um, is that included in the budget? And the answer to that is yes. Do you happen to know the the round uh, round round number cost of including I do iPads not for us? Do you know it offhand? We can get that for you. I yeah, I, I didn't know the iPads. Any, off the top of your head what it would cost, cost of the iPads for the school board to have iPads. We will get that for you. It's fine. How much? Around four thousand. Yeah. Four thousand. I think that concludes the answers to previously submitted questions. I'd like to thank everybody who took the time to send questions and thank the administrators and directors for their thoughtful and careful <clears throat> responses to everybody and the extra research that needed to be done to um, bring us those answers. Um, as always, this is sort of an ongoing Q&A process. Um, any members of the public, any members of the board, please continue to send questions to me, and we'll just you know, keep 
examining all these different programs and proposals and, until we get a really clear understanding. So <clears throat> with that, we are going to move on to enrollment and staffing. Um, it's no secret that staffing and benefits together is the largest driver of our budget. If you look at the pie chart, um, it's right around 82, 83% of our entire budget. And um, that's, it's the largest budget driver in any school department. We are not unique in that. Um, and, but because of that, it's important that we scrutinize our enrollment as well as how and why we staff our schools the way we do. Um, many, many times at various budget workshops over the years, we would have um, members of the public say, I don't understand, 20 years ago you had this number for enrollment and why, why is staffing flat or getting higher? And with, with the thought that you take a, a, a number of students and you divide it by a class size and then you just put them into boxes and that's all you need to know about staffing and enrollment. And I as a board member understood that it took a lot more, but I struggled in how to talk about that with the public. And so I think it, it we together have to help tell that story. Um, we need to talk about how schools are staffed and changed. You know, everything has changed dramatically over the years. Um, you have, many of you have this tonight and we've had it before. I love the visual representation of this. This is a list of just federal mandates, state not included, and it starts back around 1900 and goes, I think it ends, doesn't say when in the 2000s, but in the 2000s and here we are in 2020. Many of these are unfunded mandates. So the school departments have to assume the costs but are legally bound to provide those programs and services, which isn't to say that um, the board or the administration look at those um, programs and services as a burden, but it's how we have to do things. We have no choice. Um, and so this is the reality of what, a big part of why staffing looks like what it does. Um, I would prefer that people don't just take my word for it though, and we have many experts sitting right here with us tonight to help explain to the board and the public why do we staff the way we do. And I'd love Dell to come back up and talk a little bit about special education and how that drives our staffing. Basically, I'm just uh, in my in the budget packet, and I don't know exactly uh, if you go to the special ed section, mm -hmm. you'll actually see a list of all of the employees that fall under special education. And I'm essentially just going to kind of go through some of these folks, where they work, areas they cover, and space they need to do their job. Um, I'll give you a minute. So it's at the end of your special yeah. services mm -hmm. uh, part. And if you take a look at that list, I'm probably actually going to start at the bottom where we have 2.0 psychologists. Uh, we're very fortunate. We have two doctorate level psychologists uh, on staff and um, they do evaluations. We do a lot of evaluations at CAPE. Um, part of that is uh, the referrals that come in. Um, uh, Sometimes there are special education referrals from the teachers and building administrators. Other times it may be parent referrals. So those are all evaluations that include a psychological component. 
and then there's the students that are already in special education, and those students get uh, reevaluated at least every three years, and again, that will include a psychological component, and they require essentially a quiet space to do that testing. Uh, right now, uh, one of our uh, psychologists is sharing a space at Pond Cove. Thank you, Jason. And the other one is at the high school, and she has a space there. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and But yet they have assignments in all three schools. So uh, at any, any given moment, they could be uh, at Pond Cove Middle School or High School, and they just need to try to find a space that uh, they can test in. And uh, there's a few spots that they're used to, and I know building administration has been very helpful in helping them find a space. So thank you. Um, we have a full-time uh, BCBA, that's a board certified behavior analysis. That's our behavior specialist district-wide. Uh, she actually works for both special ed and regular ed. And so she supports students that may be struggling behaviorally at all <coughs> levels of the district. So she uh, she's actually sharing an office space with a psychologist at Pond Cove. And, but she as well is in all three buildings and supports students and staff within those buildings. Sometimes will be, a, uh, is in attendance for student, ass student assistant team and uh, support. student support team, sorry. And uh, so she plays a role in supporting students who are struggling uh, with the, perhaps their social emotional or behavioral regulation. Um, we have, in special ed, we have 3.5 social workers. Uh, we have, basically I'll just kind of go from building to building. At Pond Cove, we have 1.5 social workers and they both have an office and require an office. Um, the, the work they do is confidential and at times is one-on-one. -on -one. There are other times that they do groups and may need to seek alternative space because both have somewhat small rooms but adequate and uh, one is part-time and so that space that she uses at Pond Cove is utilized for other things during the week so she has to share that. So days that she's not there, there may be a psychologist in that space using it for testing. There may be a special ed teacher using it for testing. Um, so again, it's kind of, uh, usually the building administrators are great at just kind of coordinating and pointing folks in the right direction so that they have a space to do their job. We have a uh, uh, 0.4 physical therapist, and she is district-wide. She has a space that she shares with the occupational therapist at Pond Cove. Um, and when she has to go to middle school or high school, she essentially has to find a space there. Um, middle school is a, a struggle, but uh, I know the building administration uh, does find space when needed. Also, she uh, does her best to push into like uh, physical education classes as well. And uh, there is an OT room at the high school that can be shared with her as well. Um, two, uh, we have two occupational therapists district-wide, um, one that covers middle school and one that covers uh, Pond Cove and the high school. We're fortunate that she does have that shared space at Pond Cove and that there is a space designate, designated for her at the high school. It's, yes, <laughs> that's what I will say. Um, we have 3.5 speech therapists. Um, we have, so at Pond Cove we have uh, 1.5, they share a space. Generally that works, sometimes with testing, when one's testing and we wanna make sure that we're, you know, we're not distracting a student, that they do have to find other spaces. Again, Jason's done a great job of helping them find space when they need it. Um, we have one full-time speech therapist at the middle school and she has a small office. She also does her best to push into either the Beacon program and at times she actually pushes into regular ed classes as well. 
At the high school, we have one speech therapist, and she has an office down kind of in that special education wing, and most of her therapy takes place there. At times, she'll push into one of the other special education classrooms, as well as some of the general ed classrooms as well. Uh, let's see, um, we have 24 EdTech 3s. So we have EdTech 3s in every building. Um, their roles vary from building to building. Some EdTech 3s, because an EdTech 3 is, can provide direct instruction uh, under the supervision of a certified teacher. And some do provide some literacy instruction at Pond Cove as well as at middle school. Others may be supporting students within a classroom so that they can be with their gen ed peers in the least restrictive setting and yet access their educational programming. And um, the, at, times, so at times they do need instructional spaces. Um, they obviously need a place to hang their hat uh, it's always nice to be able to go in and put your stuff someplace where you know it's safe. And at Pond Cove, they, they've done a good job. One of their, the resource rooms is used for that. They kind of, that's their headquarters. And at middle school, the Beacon program is the same thing. They kind of, that's where they start their day. And if assignments change or staff are absent, that's where they do their coordinating and figuring out who's going where, who's covering what. Uh, at the high school, they are, um, they basically, Beth Milroy's room yeah, is used for the same purposes of that. Um, we have 13 special education teachers. Um, every teacher has a classroom space at all schools. We have four special ed teachers at Pond Cove. We have five special ed teachers at middle school. And we have four special education teachers at the high school and they all have um, dedicated spaces where they work with small groups uh, that can range anywhere from one or two students up to six to eight, essentially. I don't think they have bigger groups than that. Um, and the only other, um, and that's pretty much it for the schools. Any questions? I'm sorry, that was a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> Um, it's interesting, so you were talking about all these uh, people, and I just took a peek back at this chart. So special education um, came into public schools in the 70s, is that correct? IDEA 1975, I just looked it up today. Right. So. And so I imagine over, over the years, I mean, there have probably been lots of um, additions and changes to what we offer and how we offer it and that sort of thing. I heard you mention something, um, least restrictive environment and that sort of thing. Can you talk a little bit about what, what is, you know, what is that, what does that phrase mean? How does, how do we apply that? Well, I'll um, to talk a little bit about least restrictive and what it means to Cape Elizabeth. Yes. Um, in the sense that, so we're required by law to meet students' needs in the least restrictive setting as possible. In other words, um, if we can push in and support a student within the regular ed classroom versus pulling them out to a separate space, then that's what we need to do. And to do that, it is labor intensive because if you think all the students are in different classes, there's, there, you know, there's no groupings going on. So that requires a lot of bodies. And so labor intensive is that those, that's why we have the number of ed techs that we have and why we're able to keep so many kids with their gen ed peers. And it, um, it's really best practice, and I think I, I would, I perceive Cape Elizabeth does a very good job of it. Thank you. And um, also I did, one other piece is um, 504. So 504 is another term that is a part of a federal law, which came in 1973 from the Rehabilitation Act. And um, it, is essentially, so some of our students may go be referred for special ed and may go through the process, may have a disability, but they may not require specially designed instruction and but can actually be successful with accommodations. 
So a 504 plan is designed to ensure or formalize those accommodations within the classroom so that again, it'll break down those barriers of whatever the handicapping condition is so that those students can access their educational program. And generally this is mostly accommodations, but there can be exceptions to the rule depending on what the disability is and what the specific needs are. Any questions? Uh, no, sir. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. Uh, and I guess you can explain since there is a 24 ed teachers in the union, one more, and I guess that has to do with enrollments. The other one is you have highlighted, you said a number of times, space, space, space. So with current facilities, what is the ideal space for you? And if facility was not an issue, and we were constructing a new place, what's the ideal facility for you? Well, <laughs> there's, things are tight. <laughs> and, um, I mean, there's, there's a reason we're trying to grab hallway space and turn it into offices. Um, so there's, like I, I mentioned that the uh, behavior specialist and one of the psychologists are sharing a space. Well, they're sharing an empty classroom, which will not be empty next year. So then they'll be transients and move on to another space. And um, it's not ideal and um, it doesn't, doesn't really give you a good feeling, and it would be nice if they had permanent homes. Um, and uh, we would certainly work on that, but um, I, th I mean, I'm not complaining, they have a space, but things are tight, very tight at middle school. I can't, I don't know of, I mean, we had to expand the Beacon program to a second room, and it required emptying a Emptying a closet uh, for, it was the make, maker space, make, maker space. <laughs> and um, it was a lot of work. And again, I certainly thank that teacher who came in on the weekend and did most of that work. And just that he was willing to do that so that we could have a second space for students who needed a different level of support. So, I mean, again, I gotta thank the administrators who have gone out of their way to try to be creative and come up with spaces, but there's, there's not a lot there. Nasser, I appreciate you asking that question because I think as we hear you, you're not just talking about staffing, but you're talking about space. And I hope people will kind of hold that and bring that back to the building committee discussion. So I think there's um, also going to be a question um, so as you know, it applies to budget, but it'll also apply to um, discussion around buildings and right sizing and that sort of thing. And, and I think I've heard members of the public already talk about enrollment projections and what kind of space do you actually need. And so having that understanding of, you know, 20 years ago or whatever, the school's needs are very different from today. And that we're, you know, having to convert closets to be spaces for students is a concern. Mm -hmm. So I am, I'm happy that you were able to do that and we were on camera and, and can have that in our minds at yet another but different meeting. All right, any other questions? Could I just ask, excuse me, one clarifying question. Um, when you were going through the social workers, you started, you said there's 1.5 at Pond Cove and then how are the other, what, there's two... Okay, I'm sorry, so maybe I skipped over that. So there is two full-time social workers at middle school. Um, generally, we don't, we try not to, I mean, the one is, we well, consider regular ed and one special ed, but those lines get blurred all the time. If a student who is referred for special ed has a relationship, with the, one of those social workers, we, we work to preserve that. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I mean, they're both social workers, they can both deliver that service regardless of the, how they're being funded. At the high school, it's a, si a similar situation. There's two full-time social workers, uh, each one funding, funded differently, but we pretty much follow the same piece that if a student already, a student may be referred at the high school, has a relationship with one of those social workers, that relationship is preserved through that process, and we would just create goals for the IEP that through that. 
So is that, is it 4.5 or is it? So, I mean, I, so this is kind of what I had, had talked about it's, is. It's, this is his budget versus looking at <laughs> it. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was but the wondering total if there are more social, social workers. If there are more social workers that we have because our students need the support, but that we're, then we're accounting for specifically yeah. under the special ed budget. Yeah. So, yes, I mean, so we're very fortunate that students who require social work services in all three buildings are not required to be in special ed to receive social work services. And it's a, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful resource and we have, and many of our students take advantage of that resource. Sometimes we'll have students, because uh, social work doesn't stand alone. So a student may not have any other areas that they need to work on and we'll be at an IEP meeting and they don't necessarily qualify but we can say, well, we can see there's still a skill deficit in the social emotional area or social emotional learning. And we are going to address that because we can provide that through regular, the regular ed avenue. And it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful piece because it's, I think parents very much appreciate that, you know, even we have a continuum of services for all students and you don't necessarily have to be in special education to receive them. Yes. You mentioned the students receiving the 504 plans. Are they supported by the ed techs as well, those 24 ed techs? So like I said, uh, five, uh, what I was alluding to with the 504 is it's generally about accommodations, okay. not necessarily providing services, but there are exceptions to those rules. So at times there are services, and so I know that in the budget there is uh, in the Ponco budget, there is uh, an ed tech who is supporting a student. It's a very unique situation and a very, pretty rare. Okay. For the most part, our 504 students are uh, being given accommodations that the regular educator is following in the classroom or educators if there's a team. Makes sense, thanks. Any other questions? I don't think so. I'm just peeking back and looking at like when IDEA came on board, it looks like in the 90s and um, inclusion in mainstreaming requirements. So I just, I'm trying to highlight the fact that even, you know, as special ed came in in the 70s, it, it continues to evolve and change and um, bring, you know, new understandings of how to support students and that means, you know, possibly increased staffing and space. Thank you. Thank you, Dell. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Kathy, would you be willing to speak about um, a little bit about Gifted and Talented and ELL and how they have come into our sure, lives well, I, and, and at a staffing? Absolutely. So I, I think that, um, you know, as I mentioned before, when I was up here before, um, um, Services for English learners, that is that is a federal requirement. I mean, and, and again, I said it's the right thing to do, but um, but it's, an, it's a requirement that didn't exist, and now it exists. So 40 years it didn't exist, now it exists. And um, we have one full-time teacher for 23 students. Um, and I think, um, and now we have guidance that um, tells us that we're not actually meeting the needs of those students um, in accordance with uh, um, the, the provisions of the OCR, the Office of Civil Rights. So, um, and, you know, I was thinking about the space, space issue too. So the, um, the, uh, the EL teacher who works with the middle school and high school students at the high school, I think it's a, it's a room without windows, am I right? Um, it is not much bigger than a closet. Um, it used to be a closet, okay. Um, and um, you know, if, if 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 we were to have additional families move into the district, families we would want, um, and we were going to have to, um, and 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 there, 
children were at a, at a lower level of English language proficiency, then we, we would need more staffing and we would need more space. Um, so for um, the CGAT program, the Gifted and Talented Services, so that is, um, as I mentioned, we're only in the fifth year. Um, that's a state requirement and um, somehow, I don't know how, but somehow Troy was able to find a classroom um, for that teacher, um, and prior to that time, the teacher was itinerant, and it's really nice not to have to move everything with you that you need. Um, that, there are less staffing, fewer staffing pressures um, on our GT program than there are on our Yale program because we are capped at uh, three to five percent in terms of the number of students we can identify, three to five percent of our, of our student population. Um, but I think ensuring that um, that we continue to have a classroom for our CGAT teacher is critical. Laura. So, yeah, so are we capped at three to five percent because that's a requirement that it stops right. at three to five percent? Or? Right, because once you hit six percent, you just, you can't have gifted students beyond. I, it's, it is, um, I mean, I'm making a joke that's kind of fallen flat, so. Um, but yeah, no, I think we, all of us who are involved in GT in some way or another wonder where did that, it's like somebody decided that you couldn't have more, you couldn't, in a given population, you couldn't have more than 5% gifted. Okay. So the state. Which makes no sense. Right. Well, right, that's why I yeah. made that. And is the name Gifted and Talented, is that from the state yes. also? They, na they named it? Yes. Okay, just curious. Yes. It is, it is, yep. Interesting. So, they, so yeah, so the, the chapter 104, which is um, that um, part of the, the I, I don't know, it's chapter, it's chapter 104, and it's, okay. I'm not even sure, it's, it, I'm gonna ask the lawyer, Jeff. Take your word oh, for it. And chapter 104, no. <laughs> chapter. <laughs> Yeah, so at the legal code of Maine, I don't know. Okay, anyway, it's, it's, it's the name it's, is there. It, it's it's all the rules and regs around um, uh, GT ser the requirement for GT services in the state of Maine, and they that's they use gifted that's and talented, and that's to where they say three to five percent. Um, and our GT program is um, subsidized by the state, and um, so we it's every year we have to apply for that subsidy, okay. and um, and they ask for our numbers, and they you get your hand slapped um, if you are identifying more than five percent. Got it. Thank you. I just find that crazy, but thank you. Yes. Yes. Yep. You're welcome. Um, Jason, are you um, able to come up and talk to us a little bit about response to intervention? I think there are probably board members and members of the public who don't even know what that is and, sure. and where it came from and what does it do? And I actually, is this working? Yes. I actually do have a really short handout for you that may help. I just didn't want anybody to feel like they had to make it. No, and I appreciate that. But I'll explain what this is too. Thank you. It's a good handout, thank you. <laughs> Has some color on it yeah. too. Yep. Uh, so this is actually not something I prepared for tonight. This is relatively new, but it's a handout that we prepared for parents in general to begin to um, provide more information regarding RTI. So, uh, and I will, um, at first, kind of just go right through this because I think it, it's a pretty decent guideline. So, but in a nutshell, so RTI is really matching our instruction directly to student needs. And so um, I'll kind of go through this and then answer any questions I can. So RTI is response to intervention, and what it is is a framework for providing differentiated instruction for. Um, students based on their needs, their skills and skill deficits. So um, rather than just teaching to the middle and hoping that all kids get it, um, we provide services for those students who struggle to grasp concepts and, and um, secure skills. So um, what it really is, if you just go down to the still the first box, but the, fir the five numbers, these are kind of some of the essential components. So um, 
and, and I will get to the staffing piece very soon, particularly the <laughs> RTI ed techs. But so it, RTI is really, it begins with the use of common assessments to assess all students. And we assess all students three times a year. Um, and the, the one assessment that all students receive um, is the NWEA. Uh, which parents are quite familiar with by now. Uh, we have lots of other assessments that we give to students who score below a certain level on the NWEA. That's kind of like the first screener. Um, so you need to be able to assess all students throughout the year to monitor their progress. Uh, you need to provide multi-tiers of support, which I'll, I'll describe in more detail in a minute down bottom in the, in the triangle diagram. So multi-tiers of support means um, different levels of intensity of support. Um, ongoing monitoring of student progress, so even in between the three times a year that we're assessing, we're continuously monitoring the progress of students receiving RTI, um, weekly, monthly for some, weekly, um, and then having targeted interventions that are um, designed specifically for the skill deficits that, uh, to address the skill deficits that we find. And another important piece of RTI is that students move in and out, it's dynamic, so the idea is that we identify students at one point, we catch them up, and then they're out of RTI, and then they may be back in another time if they, we notice another <laughs> skill deficit, or maybe not. So to just describe the tiers of instruction, and this is where I can get into the staffing a little bit. If you look at that triangle down bottom, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the triangle or maybe <laughs> had, had some discussions about it. But so the triangle represents the, pop, uh, the student population. And so when you see tier one down bottom, that is the universal instruction that all students get within the classroom. So that's um, primarily what the classroom teacher um, is doing for all students. And that includes, um, you know, that's much more also than just teaching to the middle. You know, in general, lessons are designed to teach to the middle, and then teachers are differentiating within tier one, high, uh, more advanced reading groups, um, things like that. Um, then, so, after we give our screeners three times a year, so when, when we come to school in the fall, we screen all students. We use that data to identify students who need a little more help. Um, students that have, that are showing through assessments that they're lacking um, specific skills, they have some deficits, they would be in tier two. And that is what we, um, that's um, the primary purpose of our RTI ed techs. And we have four RTI ed techs. <coughs> and so, um, the way we define tier two would be there's some sort of specific skill that we've identified that the student needs to just learn and or practice more frequently in order to be performing at the average level of the class. And so tier two might look like a lesson with an RTI at Tech 3, three times a week, 20, 25 minutes each time. And these RTI at Techs would have multiple groups and they would be, they would, go to different classrooms. A lot of this is pull out and in like intense um, intervention on skills. Sometimes it's push in though um, into classrooms. If, that, if anytime we can do that and we think we can be as effective, we'd push in. So um, you look at, there are some students that have that are significantly below grade level and are lacking more than just a few skills. There's a few gaps. They would receive tier three. And that tier three is our most intensive um, level of intervention. So that's um, most highly trained interventionists, um, more, uh, greater frequency for five days a week and greater duration, 30 minutes plus. So those kids are, are quite significantly behind. And so we identify all those needs and we place the students in the right, um, in the right setting. So, that, that explains how we use the RTI ed techs. Uh, I just want to add to that since we're really talking about staffing as well. So this is one thing that the RTI ed techs do. Um, it's really an interesting position um, because they, of course, do a lot of duties, a lot of supervision. They have to be very flexible because um, their assignments can change, their groups can change, they can be asked to do different things. Uh, they are very, very busy individuals at our school, um, and sometimes um, it seems as if they're um, 
their position requires um, a skill set that some of the others don't, that kind of that flexibility piece. And we're fortunate to hire um, very highly skilled RTI techs that can sometimes um, even, you know, appear overqualified. Uh, and so that is, it's, it can be tricky. We have a lot of RTI techs that have been teachers before, had their own classrooms, and they have to adjust to a position where they could be asked to do something different every day. So um, we're so appreciative to have them. Um, I can't, I know that they just came, um, the year I came is when they first started. We kind of joined Pond Cope together, the techs and myself. I don't know what we would do without them. Um, and I think they, it, it's had a, a really great effect on our school in turn, in beyond even just RTI. So do you have any other questions? I want to make sure I hit on everything that you're looking for. I don't think so. Very okay. Thorough. Oh, <laughs> I think, yes. Is uh, NWEA NW your only standard to indicate whether a student needs uh, the support? Right. Are there any other standards? So no. So we have we have other assessments too. So we actually do have other assessments that all students receive. The NWEA is the only assessment that all students receive three times. We another um, another major one is our developmental reading assessment, the DRA. So all students do get that every year um, at least once, um, and then so students that are functioning, let's say a student in one year ends the year below grade level, uh, the next year at the beginning of the year, they would receive a series of assessments that students that ended the year on grade level wouldn't receive. You know, so we're kind of always checking the big picture with the NWEA, but then um, uh, implementing assessments on different students at different levels to keep tabs on everyone at all times. So there's, a, there's several, um, there, there are phonics assessments, developmental reading assessment, and then we have ma math assessments as well. So I've, I've spoken a lot about literacy, but we, RTI is math as well. So just one more thing. So um, we have right now, just as of today, 139 students receiving tier two in, in the RTI um, system receiving tier two and three. And so when I say now, that's not, more students this year will benefit from that. And, and let me correct that, it's 139 blocks. So there's 68 in literacy and 73 in math. Some of those students are, might be the same students that are receiving, but it's still 139 blocks in, in our system. Um, and so, but, We'll be, we continue to screen and new kids come in and some kids leave. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Okay. Yep. Next up, I was hoping Troy could talk a little bit about um, social emotional needs and I, mean, I, I keep looking back at this because you know, there are so many different um, requirements that are asked of us and I just want to, I feel kind of bad referring back to this because there are things that we have to do, but we do them also because it's the right thing to do. So if you want to talk about that a little bit. Perfect. So knowing that I was between Jason and Jeff and knowing I was not needing a handout, I figured I should make one. <laughs> because I kind of have an idea they probably will have one. Um, but then I get sitting there and I kind of get nervous thinking, ah, I don't want this to look job description-y. So I'm not sure that I'm gonna give it to you now that I have it, but I'm gonna read it. Um, so oh, essentially, essentially I, I agree totally with what you just said. There's so many things that we're mandated to do and that we can get caught up in that and sometimes our eye moves off a little bit of what we should do and, and how we benefit everyone. Um, and right now I think it's clearly a, a movement of foot probably state and, and nationwide, but definitely here in Cape, the movement of, of focusing on the whole child, not just the academic, um, and educating them socially and emotionally. That is a heavy lift. Teachers are not gonna be able to do all that alone. And um, 
in school counselors traditionally had a job before this big push came along. So to think it's gonna add, it's not that it's not in their kind of ballpark, but to think that we're gonna add more to that plate without losing something else is also kind of naive. Um, we, like Dell kind of described the role of our social workers really well and our, and our school counselors. And at the middle school, I'm fortunate we added a social worker just I think two years ago. Um, so what I did is I talked to them today, and I get nervous because it's so different at the high school to what Pond Cove's looks like. So I, don't, I kind of talked to mine about what is, what do you see the role of, of what you guys do? And I know the things they do, but I really wanted their idea of like in general, how do they view their role? Um, so in talking with them, I'll admit Sarah Hansen helped make this. Um, so I'm going to read it. Uh, <laughs> And it was really the idea of a school's responsibility today is about educating the whole child, um, which definitely includes the social and emotional growth. Um, school social workers, school counselors, and nurses uh, are pr the primary staff members tasked with directly supporting students in their mental health, as well as supporting and educating all adults who work with those kids. Um, there's always something new coming, and teachers are never going to be able to keep up with it alone. And they really are our first line of defense with our kids. They see them the most, they see them every day and they need to have a lot of tools to work with. Um, all of our buildings use them differently, but we really decided to break it down in two, two kind of headings, prevention and intervention. Um, and the prevention heading for social emotional learning is really curriculum-based instruction, either taught by social workers, nurse, um, our nurses teaching CPR, and you know we're working on getting her into the first aid room. So really kind of using your resources slightly differently, but the nurse is included in here. Um, so to teach that kind of curriculum-based instruction so everybody gets a similar thing and coordinate it with outside agencies, examples include anxiety, depression, education, and ways to manage with, with that, um, and how to recognize and stand up to bullying, career exploration, all of those things are, are, are programs that we, have, that we teach and we work kind of to develop common language on a, on a regular basis. That group under the prevention heading also provides a lot of professional development to our staff. So, um, Education provided to staff on how to best support students' mental health um, needs, either through formalized trainings that they do with the staff, or informal consultation one-on-one -on -one with the teacher, you know, trying to work through some, some concerns. And some examples, and this is really helpful for us this year, are, you know, they had to do a, a signs of sexual abuse, which is a new mandated training just this year um, for all staff in Maine schools must have. And our counselors attended to train the trainer session, and now they can be trainers. But they had to go and do that and come back and train, and they're kind of our on-point school experts for that. Um, suicide prevention, again, it's mandated by the state. They, that was a heavy lift for them in the beginning of this year. You know, the, the expectations change and, and, the whole and the whole staff had to be trained, bus drivers, you know, the custodial in, in the kitchen and everybody had to be trained and, and that was all fell on this work of the social workers and school counselors working together. Um, professional development also, um, some more of those we're coordinating without Maine regarding supporting all students' sexual orientations. You know, there's always new things coming at our teachers and, and really everybody's well intended, but they're not always up to speed with the best way to deal with things. And they're really becoming the experts in our building, the go-to people for our staff to, to get that support. Um, a lot of things they do, are they do some uh, after school clubs and, and wide variety of initiatives for students to explore and learn more about mental health and about who they are as individuals and how to support friends that might be struggling with issues. Um, and how do you, if that's really a big skill. If, if I'm to teach a 12 year old how to, you know, interpret how their friend's acting and then to think they're not betraying their trust to go and, and tell an adult, that's a pretty big step, and that takes a lot of education from Pond Cove right up through. So um, we see that happening every day, and it's really the work of these people that kind of do that. And then it goes to intervention, and that really gets into the counseling. So that can either be individual group um, as needed, with a focus on whatever is impacting their life and kind of getting in, making school hard for them, or just life in general hard for them. Um, some students have specific social emotional goals within their IEPs, they'll just explain that very well. And some students have access to counseling through their 504 plans. Um, the big thing to remember is all students have the right to access a school, social worker, and counselor when needed. And I feel like we're really fortunate here to have that. You know, I've not been in a district where that's happened before. In fact, it's been hard to fulfill your IEP needs. Um, say nothing about supporting the general population. So this, that's, I feel very fortunate that we have that. And then the last step really is crisis intervention. 
And that really occurs for self-harm, um, ideation, uh, homicide, homicidal ideation surface. And, you know, unfortunately, these things are on the rise throughout everywhere. And we need to be able to be kind of well prepared to deal with that the best that we can as a staff and as a school. Because we really are the center of a community. And the community counts on us for those supports and services, not just our kids in our school. So I think that's an important thing to remember. Um, and then just lastly, all of everything that is talked about take us a, a pretty high level of collaboration with parents, outside agencies, you know, therapists, state and government agencies, and none of these things are quick. You know, none of these are like practicing, you know, for studying for a test. These are things that the, they work with kids for hours sometimes in a day. And you go to school not knowing what you're going to get. And you might have a plan to do all these things, but before you know it, it's lunchtime and you haven't left this one person. So um, this level of support is, is, I think, vital to our school. I think it separates us from, from many places. And, and even though it may not be a mandate, a, a federal mandate, I think it's a community mandate that we continue to provide that level of service. So questions? Thanks. We appreciate Thank you. you making you sure you don't want. Well, I don't want it to be come out that this is what Troy <laughs> said social workers do. Okay, that's not really it, but it's really. Jump right out the handout. Well, I'll just take third, I guess. <laughs> but, so, but I just I don't want to misrepresent people right. where it's across three keep schools. Your hands it's just a really good idea fine. of how it is. So. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks so much. Can I just thank Jeff and Jason for motivating Troy? <laughs> Jeff, I'd love it if you'd come up and talk a little bit about our, you know, our tradition and community expectations. Um, and then, you know, it, it's that tricky, I think our whole, our whole district deals with, you know, we have this kind of community expectation and this um, reputation for high performing, but we also have to make sure that we're not letting students slip through the cracks. And so we've got some great programs at the high school for that too. Okay, so I do have a handout. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to tell the public I specifically said they didn't have to. I wanted them not to feel as they had to do this. I just didn't want you to have more work. <laughs> or I might want to reconsider. <laughs> we will get Troy's out. Oh, no, we didn't build a small For the public. I like the title of this. All right. Um, so I thank you for the question. Thank you for the opportunity. It it led me to learn a little bit more about ED 279. Marcy knows still a whole lot more than I possibly know. Um, but I've learned a lot the last couple of years about ED 279. So I have prepared this handout, and the title of it is Essential Programs and Services, Not a Way to Build a Small, Comprehensive, High-Performing Public High School. And that's really not its intent. That's not a slam at it. It's the EPS formula has actually <clears throat> garnered a lot of national attention as a reasonable way to build um, more equitable support for schools um, based on socioeconomic disparities in Maine than is done in a lot of places. So, but it is deliberately not designed to, to create high-performing high schools. That's just, that's not the mission of it. Um, so I did uh, discover the, I, in, in grayed out, text there you see the statutory definition of what essential programs and services is. And it's really a way to try to get all, it says, all or most students to meet the learning standards. Um, meeting learning standards is a, is a great accomplishment for any school. If that's all we did is met learning standards, um, 
Cape Elizabeth would be disappointed with our performance. Mm -hmm. Parents would be disappointed by our performance and students would be disappointed by their own performance. Um, and I'm, I don't, I'm not an expert just on Pond Cove in the middle school, but I'm guessing a similar analysis would be true of them as well. I'm just doing the high school piece here. Um, so I've just asked and answered a few questions here. What features of CEH, CEHS experience move students, many students, not all, many students beyond benchmarks? Um, and, and almost all students in, in Cape Elizabeth High School take three, four years of science, math, and world language. That is not required. In fact, zero years of world language are required. Uh, most students take four, which is a smart thing for them to do. It doesn't take four years of science, math, and world language to meet, for most kids, the, ba the basic level of the learning results. Um, properly interpreted. Okay, so, so, so most kids take a lot more, and our advanced placement program is certainly well beyond. In fact, many aspects of our honors program as well are sort of well beyond, and some of our CP programs as well are well beyond what students are required. So for the next part, um, I want to refer the board to ED279, um, which in my binder, and, and it will be there for you as well if Marcy's the one who put it in that tab of my binder and not me, uh, but it's in my binder at funding slash tax impact. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the second or third document back. It's the colorful one that looks like this. And I'll wait until you're able to find it. Everybody got that? Yeah. All right, so I just wanted to refer, I'm not gonna to refer to a lot of specifics in this, but I wanted to give one example, because I realized that I asked the question, if we reduced our regular education teaching staff by six and a half teachers um, to 33.22 teachers, which is the EPS, is, is the number of teachers that the EPS funding for the high school is based on, what would be the impact of reducing at that level? And it would mean, so, but I thought it would be helpful to point out where that number comes from. So if you go to the first page of ED 279, and then you go to part B, staff positions, the first row says teachers. And if you go to the right on that row, under the column that says um, 9 to 12 EPS FTE, mm -hmm. you see the number 33.22. Does everybody, do, yes. do folks find that? That is based on our total student load under, the, under this document divided by 16, because 16 to one is the EPS magic number that funding is based on for high school teachers. So, so what that is saying is the amount that the state is, is basing its funding on for Cape Elizabeth High School is 33.22 teachers, even though we in fact this year have 39.75 teachers. So it's that difference between 39.75, what we now have, and this 33.22 number, which is what leads me to ask the question and answer the question, what would happen if we reduced Cape Elizabeth High School regular ed teaching staff by six and a half teachers. Um, so what would happen is most single section classes, we call them singletons, they're classes that are offered that there's only one section of the class based on student signups. So it's not like a ninth grade physics class where there are multiple sections of the class that are offered during multiple periods. These are most classes that are only offered once during the school day in one period. That's a single section or singleton class. 
most of those would have to be eliminated because that tends to be where you find some inefficiencies because we tend to say that if we get 10 to, at least 10 students to sign up for a class, if we can staff it, we will. Um, but that does lead to some inefficiency in terms of hitting that optimum that the 16 to one is based on. Um, so a lot of single section classes would be eliminated. Our average class size would move from what it right now is, which is 16.8. Um, you multiply that number by 16% or 1.16, which is the percentage difference between 39.75 and 33.22, and you'd get to an average class size of 19.5 compared to the 16.8 right now. Then you multiply that number, the average class size by five, because that's, that's the typical course load, full-time course load for a full-time high school teacher, and you would get to an average student load per teacher of 97.5. The range under the school board policy for student load per teacher at the second secondary level is 75 to 90. So you can see the EPS formula would push us beyond the maximum range um, under, I think it's policy JJJ. That's I funny. have it here tonight. When you're done, I'm, I have some handouts that Marcy will hand out that will kind of support what you're talking about. Okay. So then that would definitely mean the, the taking, a, taking teachers out of the achievement center. Um, Teachers out of school load would increase, and as I explained at the last board meeting, I won't go through that again, but that would mean correcting load increases for teachers, which means inevitably the rigor of assignments or the frequency of rigorous assignments would decrease. Um, that's, that's a given. Um, and students would have, few, would have fewer options of classes to take. Um, again, because we have to build a schedule where you're getting more the optimum number of class size, which really typically requires you to have a class which is offered multiple times during the school day, because otherwise you're gonna you're gonna you're going to go move go low. So then, a few facts about the EPS formula. And this is the part that I had the most fun with because I Googled EPS formula staff I something like this, something, and I came across a very fascinating study. I footnoted it in below if any board members would like to look at it. It was actually written, it's very current. It was written just this past, one year ago, this month. Um, it was done by the um, uh, Maine Educational Policy Research Institute of the University of Southern Maine. Um, and it was done for the Department of Education and basically the State Department of Education. It was basically, here's what we know the EPS formula is. What are the actual numbers you find in actual schools across the state? So that was really the purpose of the report. So this was fascinating. Um, the EPS calculates funding for high school based on 16 to one student to teacher ratio. The actual student teacher ratio average across all high schools in Maine is significantly below that. It's 14.6, which I didn't know. 78% of high schools according to this report are below the EPS student-teacher ratio. So Cape Elizabeth High School is not alone in being below the student-teacher ratio called for by the EPS, it's the norm. Um, then, the, then they have one, a couple pages where they analyze, if you look at average actual student-teacher ratio it means low poverty, high performing schools, that's us. So they take all the schools in a market basket that meet that low performing, low poverty, high performing schools, what's the, what's the average student teacher ratio? And the one year ago today, they said 13, 13.1, 13 um, which is actually interesting because that actually is lower than our student teacher ratio at Cape Elizabeth High School. So we are actually have a, lower staffing um, per student than most low poverty, high performing school districts do. I'd previously given the board some numbers from our closest comparable districts, just from making phone calls and looking at websites. And I've also given the board numbers from high performing schools based on US news ranking, because that's one of the sets of data that they produce. 
Um, but it was inter but I hadn't didn't have the breadth of data that this report is based on, so that was that was that was interesting to me. Um, then I want to refer the board back again to so everything I've talked about so far has to do with the number of teachers, number of regular ed teachers. But if you go down, if you look in the same same section of the EPS formula where it says staff positions, they also have numbers for guidance counselors, numbers of librarians, number of administrators, numbers of secretaries, number of all those things. So in order to, and, and they base the formula, their, the funding formula based on all those numbers. Here's what the implication would be um, if we actually tried to set that as some kind of a loose, rough, proximate goal. Um, we would need to reduce our staff by one and a half administrators, so half of our administrative positions would disappear. Um, we would need to cut our librarian position approximately in half. Uh, we would need to reduce the nurse to approximately half time. She's currently full time. Um, we would need to cut one and a half of our current four secretarial positions. This is the one that we could not, I mean, the school would fall apart if we tried to do that. Um, the others, maybe we could work, work our way through, but that one, no chance. Um, uh, we would definitely need to close the Achievement Center and or cut out our academic skills positions because those are staffed by ed techs and according to the EPS funding formula, we have more than the state will fund based on their formula. Um, we would definitely need to eliminate uh, the regular education social worker that that Troy was just talking about, um, and that would be devastating. And this last one, I'm a little bit unsure of. I think I'm reading the formula correctly, and it sort of makes sense because the formula is based on what do you have to get, what do you have to have in terms of staffing to meet the learning results? Well, you don't have to offer football to meet the learning results. So under the EPS funding formula, we'd have to decrease our extracurricular program, I calculate, by over 90%. Or a hundred percent. So, uh, Marcy, do you mind handing out those handouts? So, one of the handouts that I um, asked Marcy to photocopy for us is just our school board um, class size and teacher load policy. And there's also, thank you. And I already have one of these, but I'll take it. Um, also, it's a teaching staff comparison. And um, it is based on EPS. And so it, it sort of kind of goes into this conversation. So before we let you go, maybe we could look at these and if anybody has any questions. Um, because so part of, part of our staffing, as we've heard tonight, part of it is very much governed by mandates, state mandates, federal mandates and that sort of thing. But then, we have local control, and that's where we have this, you know, difference between EPS and what our community expects and wants for its children. And it is pretty well encapsulated in our class size and teacher load policy, which is something that um, has been updated many times over the years. It gets, <coughs> um, a lot of participation there, and usually, for those of you who, who have ever been to policy committee, not a lot of people <laughs> show up, um, except for very specific policies. And um, this is one of them. People care a lot about this. We have a lot of input about this. And so this is where we really are able to say, this is what we believe in in Cape Elizabeth. This is, and this is based on research. This isn't just, oh, you know, we heard this from a neighbor. There are volumes of, of research that talk about optimum class sizes at different ages and different learning stages and teacher load. Uh, especially at the middle and high school. So, so this sort of talks about where we do have choice, why we've made those choices. And then I thought this was interesting. This was, um, we had a, a chart similar to this last year for the first time, which is um, teaching staff comparisons. And whoever developed it last year, and I don't even know who it was, if it was Jeff or if it was our former business administrator, but just pulled a handful of um, 
neighboring districts and talked about <clears throat> So the first column, and this is this is just what it, Marcy can help me talk about the data a little bit more. This is just what is um, reported on the DOE website for EPS. Um, the it's not like a projection of next year's um, enrollment or anything like that. It's just it's pretty static whenever we're able to pull that data. So the first column is what the state EPS formula says each school department should have for teachers to meet that bare bones minimum standard of EPS. And then the second column is the actual full-time equivalent number of teachers in that school department. And then the third column is the percent over EPS. And then the attending pupils average. And then it's that percent over EPS is represented in a chart below. And I, I find it interesting because Cape Elizabeth is by no means the leader in that group, um, nor are we the, the floor of that group. I'd say, I mean, we're essentially equivalent with Scarborough. And so we're at 20%, they're at 19%. But then we have um, RSU 51, Cumberland, North Yarmouth, and Falmouth. Those two school departments are both at 28% above EPS. So it kind of highlights that each school department, probably through their own policies around class size and that sort of thing, are really <coughs> making those choices to um, have high-performing school departments and, and try to help their students achieve beyond just meeting needs and that sort of thing. So, I just I'm, I was piggybacking on you. <laughs> and, and if I can piggyback on what you just said, because um, there are definitely things that we do that are not required. The, there is no requirement to have anything comparable to the Achievement Center. Um, there's no requirement to have anything comparable to our academic skills program, which supports using ed techs, students who need support with organizational skills and executive skills. Um, they, they work really hard with kids um, and there's no reason for us, there's no requirement that we have anything comparable to Freshman Academy, which is a program that we're really proud of that supports students with the transition to high school and I think has had enormous success um, in, in sort of hap helping many more kids to be successful in that tra transition. Um, the percentages of students, for example, who have been referred to the assistant principal's office since freshman academy came in have plummeted. Um, and it's, it, there's no question it's, it's cause and effect. It's not correlation, it's cause and effect because you can point to the specific kids who are put in. Um, and they learn wonderful things. And it's, it's not a, any sort of a remedial thing. It's something that actually we would love to be able to offer to every student because it's about getting to know yourself getting to understand your strengths and weaknesses and finding your voice. So the kids in um, freshman skills, freshman academy, for example, they give speeches um, and they're pretty rigorous and they, they, it, it's pretty impressive what they do. And they learn how to discuss, discuss really important personal topics in a really meaningful way. There's no question that that program would, would absolutely disappear. Um, we, we just couldn't offer it. And those are just a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Jeff? I have a quick question. Um, so this is really interesting to me, and um, obviously the school funding formula is based on the EPS standards in many ways. Is there any, uh, I'm sure there is, I mean, we're not gonna solve the EPS issue, or even that's our purview, but it's interesting to me that it sounds like that's a basic benchmark. It's not adequate, at least for a lot of school departments, think it's not adequate. Is there any conversation around the state uh, to increase those on a statewide basis, which obviously would then um, allow the state to uh, share more of the expenses? Because it sounds like what I'm hearing is that this, it's the basic benchmark is so low, or it's at least low, I won't qualify it that way that each community is obviously responsible through its own property taxes to raise it up to a standard that actually is what most communities want. So for a sort of statewide policy perspective, um, is there any discussion around whether those statewide benchmarks are 
uh, are you know should be raised and because it's it's not only a performance issue for to me or a expectation issue but it's also a funding issue mm -hmm. and how we share expenses around the state uh, i mean i i would probably defer i suspect both donna and marcy would know yeah. more about that in terms of statewide discussions than me i will just give you one snippet that i do happen to know yeah. um and I, i'm not sure if this is under review but very quietly three or sometime within the last three to five years the eps student teacher ratios for two school levels. One was the high school, and I can't remember if the other was elementary school or middle school, actually were increased. Um, so essentially decreasing the number of teachers that would be accommodated. Whether there's conversation about going back or even reducing it more closer to reality, I'm not sure. Um, I, again, I would probably defer to Donna and Marcy, who are much more connected on a statewide basis than yeah, I am. They have done some studies mm -hmm. um, on the funding formula, and one of the problems is that there are winners and losers, uh, so you can't make everybody happy right. by even changing it. So yeah. I, I heard that there's another study in the wind, but I'm not sure if that's correct or not. Just a rumor. My yeah. assessment is that as long as it's a zero-sum game, it's going to be really difficult because there are people who, uh, there are districts that are able to um, receive their um, EPS funding and more than meet their needs, whereas there are many school districts that can't. So yeah. There's got to be a better way to do it, but I think it. Yeah, and not I, not everybody's willing to come to the table. And it seems to me that there's sort of two different discussions. One is how do you do this, the formula, which they were getting at, and there's winners and losers. But then, what is the what what are you b building the formula towards? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. And mm -hmm. you know, if we're already sort of under performing, what it's what it's doing is we're, is we're pushing down to the local level where we're going to make that up, mm -hmm. instead of rising the tide across the state. Is I guess what I'm getting at. But that's in a different setting that we've discussed that I think mm -hmm. I think it's just good to keep in mind that we're when when we talk about the state get you know sort of deciding what we should spend it's based on that level that benchmark mm -hmm. and in terms of yes. what money we're going to actually yes. then get those will be something to address to so you can raise these questions yeah right yeah, yeah right yeah. Mm -hmm. anything else for me thank you Jeff you're very welcome yes. thank you <clears throat> So I don't know if the board wants to have any more discussion or have any comments about um, how we staff our schools or yeah, Phil raised an interesting sort of philosophical question for the state level and that might be something that we could continue to raise with our representatives and, and senators, I think would be valuable. No? Um, thank you again to all the administrators that I um, emailed on the fly at about midnight when I had a panic attack because I had forgotten to email you yesterday afternoon and um, in, in helping us have this conversation and share your expertise with us and with the public so that we can give a greater understanding because I really don't feel like we should shy away from how we staff our schools. I think that we should be proud of how we staff our schools and we just need to explain to the public why we do it that way. Um, so I thank everybody very much. Um, so we have a regular business meeting next week, so we will not be having as much fun with budget. But our next budget workshop will be on Tuesday, March 24th at 6.30 p.m. I believe that is in the high school library. Is that correct? You're looking at the schedule, so I'm gonna... Which day, the 24th? The 24th? Yes, it's in the library. Great, high school library. Um, our topics for that meeting will include a um, discussion of the unassigned fund balance and um, wrap up of any questions and answers and, and beginning to kind of get our sense of where we land on the budget and if we need to, uh, what sort of guidance we need to give to the superintendent as far as revised budget. Um, 
So that's what we will be talking about next time. And I would like to thank everybody for joining us here tonight. And good night. Thank you. Public comments? I'd like to just offer public an opportunity for public comment one more time. Oh, Mr. Phillips. I think that's it. No. Thank you. Good night.